happy Friday, everyone. Yeah. Um, okay. We're uh, chugging right along. We did, uh, we did finish on, I think, an example. You'd think I'd remember. It was only yesterday. Feels like just yesterday. Um, oh, yeah. We were talking about independent events and probabilities, right? And so then we said, okay, well, even if I have a series of independent uh, events, I can multiply those outcomes uh, and the probabilities of those outcomes, rather, and find the total probability of all of them happening together, right? So event one and event two and event three and event four. So in terms of review, which is not really review, um, admittedly, but whenever you find yourself saying or, right? This or this, okay? So A or B, you're going to be adding. Okay, so whenever you say or, uh, usually means, oops, addition. Right, and that's in terms of the, the probabilities, right? Then you're usually adding the probabilities. If they are not disjoint, right, then you're adding them and then subtracting the overlap. But in general, right, you're still uh, adding. Whereas if you're saying and, right, A and B and C, right, then it usually means multiplication. I'm emphasizing this today because it's going to be so important when we start section 3.2, which we are about to start right now. <laughs> Conditional probability. It was like I couldn't stop it from happening. Uh, Conditional probability. Huh? So Yesterday, we introduced this idea of independence, right? So recall, independent events are when knowing the outcome of one event has no impact on the probability of the next event. Okay, so when knowing I don't know how to say it, uh, in brackets, I guess, when knowing the outcome of one event uh, does not impact the probability of the next event of the next event. Yeah capitalize this. So now we're going to introduce versus not independent events. So independent events are things like if you draw a card from a deck of cards, but then you put it back, right? Then knowing that I drew a, a queen of hearts has no impact on the probability of drawing my next card because we put it back. So the deck stays the same. Now, if I wanna switch that to uh, not independent events, right? Then I say I drew a, a queen of hearts and I put it to the side and it's no longer in the deck, right? Now that impacts all the other probabilities, right? Because now there's only 51 cards in the deck and there is no more queen of hearts, right? So the probability of drawing that now is zero. And so all the other ones are adjusted, right? Well, Fred and I were actually discussing that um, last night. Like, what is the probability? He thought it was going to be um, one of the 51 instead of so four when you had. Uh, yeah, so it depends, it depends on what, like, what you're talking about, okay. right? Uh, but the probability of any one card, if you've removed one, is one in 51. 
but usually you want to talk about like what's the probability of drawing another heart for example yeah, all right then it'd be 12 and 51. Okay, yeah, so if you were looking for the king of hearts, you drew the king of hearts. So on your second draw, would you draw the king of hearts and still be the king of hearts? Uh, yes. Yeah, because there's fewer cards. Okay. Yeah, so it does improve the probability as, as you remove cards, right? So uh, not independent events. I rarely call it dependent events but it would make sense, right? Dependent, dependent <laughs> events, right? You could also call them dependent events, but I just say that they're not independent. Um, that's when, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. And so this is when we have conditional probabilities, right? So uh, when two events are not independent, we have conditional probabilities. So then conditional probabilities, it's gonna be like a daisy chain of information here. <laughs> so conditional probabilities are things like, uh, if I knew, know that it's, uh, I don't know, four degrees out today, right? Then I know the probability of it being 20 degrees tomorrow is very, very low, right? But if it, was, if it was 20 degrees today, then the probability that it's 20 degrees tomorrow is kind of high, right? So it depends. So these two events are dependent on each other. Same thing with the cards. If a stock goes up, in general, stocks go up with it, right? And that kind of thing. So there are lots of different conditional probabilities of it. And so here now, knowing the outcome, of an event, and I am just restating it because it is so important. So knowing the outcome of an event uh, impacts, mostly because I can't remember how to, which effect I would want, affects or effects? Affects, I think. So I choose impacts uh, <laughs> of an event, impacts the probability of the next event. How we're going to denote this is we're going to write the probability of A given B. Okay. And so this is what we use for conditional probabilities. And this vertical bar you read as uh, given. So now, Right, knowing that B happened, right, then what's the probability of A? Right. So here we read this. We read this as the probability of A given B has happened. So that's where we're headed. We've actually already seen uh, dependent events or not independent events. If you kind of flip back to the examples from uh, January 24th and 26th. So from the examples or from the, I'll call it the voting example and I'll bring it in again from January 24th and 26th, because we finished it on the 26th, but let me go to the 24th first. 
Wow, wasn't that stuff so fun? Ah. All right, so this is the one I'm talking about. And we went through and we did a bunch of, uh, of the questions together. And then you did something similar, I think, on the quiz. But that's not there. So then we picked up on the 26th, continuing from last day. And what we finished on was do, so here, this is what I wanna bring in. Do political ideology, so how people vote, and views on immigration appear to be dependent or independent. And we were even able to answer this question without knowing about the rules of conditional probabilities and stuff like that. But we did land on, okay, well, because these uh, probabilities are all different, right? Now we know percentages and proportions are all probabilities, right? And so because these probabilities are, are so different, depending on how they vote or depending on which category we're talking about, right? And so then we said they're likely dependent. So now we'll be able to work through that and look at that kind of mathematically instead. And so here, this is from uh, January 26th. But that's when we said they're likely dependent on each other. Yeah. Now I have cheated a little bit. Okay, a lot. I'm gonna mark this up, bump it to the top. Yeah. So what we have, let's see if I can, okay, fine, copy. I'll paste the question in again. Whoa, bumped down so many pages. No. Just so we have the question again, right? But we had how people vote, right? Or how they declare that they vote and how they feel about these citizenship options. Okay. And so now what we can do is we can convert these raw counts to probabilities instead. And then we can deal with these as probabilities. You can do it just uh, as you need it. Or if you're working in, um, in any sort of software, it's really easy to do, right? In, in R, for example, you can just tell it to make a prop.table and it'll just do it for you, right? And so it'll just convert it. Um, I had to do it the old fashioned way. And so here, um, we often convert the raw counts into proportions to simplify our probability calculations, right? You don't have to, but it might help to simplify probability calculations. So I've done that here. Yes, by hand. sort of a little bit of help. I rounded to probably an inconsistent, no, it looks pretty consistent. Consistent number of decimal places. That's, that's impressive, right? Uh, and one thing that I didn't bother fixing is that they didn't quite add to one, right? If you're rounding, it gets a little bit difficult. So then I'd have to, you know, play around with my rounding a little bit and, and make sure that they add to one, but I'm, I'm willing to just take it as it is. 
I guess I was sick of doing it. So approximately one, close enough to one. All right. So right here, we have these probabilities. There's a little bit of terminology that we'll introduce here. Let's see. Where is it? Here. Let's see. So just some terminology for what we're talking about here. Okay. And I uh, feel like I mentioned it when we were introducing these tables and then I said, ah, just forget about it. We'll talk about it later. And here we are later talking about it. Um, so these totals, right? Uh, because they're proportions now, right? Then they are also probabilities. And so we call these the marginal probabilities, right? Because the totals are in the margins and how you would remember the marginal probabilities are for a single variable, right? Overall, how do you, or um, what proportion or what's the probability of someone being a conservative 0 0.39516, right? And it doesn't matter how they feel about the citizenship option. Yeah. And so these uh, here, Can't really see it. So the totals and the total probabilities based on a single variable are marginal probabilities. Whereas the probability of outcomes two or more variables in a table, in a two way table, we only have two variables, but uh, the probability in the center here, we call those the joint probabilities. Yeah. And it's basically uh, the and probabilities or the joint probabilities, right? Conservative and in favor of the first option, right? Moderate and in favor of the first option, right? So joint probabilities are going to be circled in pink, and they're going to be these guys. I think of it as uh, variable one and variable two. I guess outcome in variable one and no, well, too picky. So here we have these joint probabilities. So now we can talk about things like uh, what's the probability of, now here's where we introduce this terminology of, okay, so based off of this sample, right, if I randomly select someone from the population, what's the probability that they are uh, going to vote liberal, right? Well, we assume that this sample, right, is representative of the population. So then we can use these probabilities as the probabilities when we randomly select a new person, right? So that's a little bit uh, weird in the beginning for sure, okay? But uh, we can find things like, so using the table, we can find, the probability that someone votes liberal. Just looking here, doesn't matter how they feel about the citizenship option, it's 0 0.20806. Uh, no, because probabilities are uh, decimals. Right. Although, yeah. 
you yeah you can uh because we usually if you're writing a report right then when you communicate to your client you definitely convert to percentages mm -hmm. right and so we communicate in percentages but uh really nothing that we do is actually a percentage we just communicate in percentages it's kind of weird i guess but that's just how it is um i'll refer to these in terms of the option numbers so we can find the probability that they're in favor of option one or i i guess All right first option doesn't matter how they vote 0.31693 I can find things like the probability of voting liberal and in favor of option I. If I show you the table, you can too. So if they have to be liberal and in favor of option of the first option, right, that probability is 0.14758. using what we learned yesterday, right? Are voting liberal and being in favor of option I, are they independent events? Right. How would we, so here, are voting liberal and being in favor of option I, independent events. How do we check that? Well, that's when we use, we, we flip the formula and we say, okay, I'm gonna use this formula. And if it's true, then they're independent. What's the formula that we're using? We're gonna use the probability so Let's just clarify here. If A and B are independent, then the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Okay. So I did round. So I'll be a little bit, a little bit lenient on these numbers, not quite matching up, right? I would want to use the fractions, the proper fractions, if I was unsure. But what we're going to find is that we're not even close, right? So really what we're going to check is the probability of voting liberal and in favor of option I. Is it equal to? So that's what I want to know, right? Are these independent? Well, this is only true if they are independent, right? And so here, is it the same as the probability of voting liberal times the probability of being in favor of an I? I have those values here. So it's a matter of plugging them in and seeing if they are equal, 0.14758. Is it equal to, 0 0.20806 times 0 0.31693. Oh, I almost forgot. You caught my typo last yesterday. Okay, confession time. I don't know what happened. Well, I copied my notes and that they were wrong, obviously. That's what happened. And no one caught it last term. That's what I'm concerned about. <laughs> oh, well, uh, it's supposed to be really, really small. I don't know where, why I did that. So part B, what's the probability that they're all left-handed? All right, I can change that. 
sorry about that. I did fix it in the notes that I posted. So I can go back there. Sorry about that, but thank you for catching it. Uh, okay, so when I multiply these out, I guess you can't trust my math, uh, but <laughs> trust it with a grain of salt. Um, in my notes, I have 0 0.06594302814. Now I did use the fractions in my notes, so they might not be exactly this, but um, 0.14758. But clearly these values are not the same, right? And so now we have mathematical proof that these things are not independent, right? Because what can we also say? Okay, well, if, if voting liberal and being in favor of option I, they're dependent, then nothing else can be independent, right? They're all dependent on each other. Yeah. And so these two are not equal to each other. Therefore, voting liberal and being in favor of option I are not independent events. What if you, I don't know, didn't have the table and you only had a, a certain amount of information, right? What if you had to find the probability of uh, voting liberal and being in favor of option I, right? What if you had to find that and uh, calculation, then we would need conditional probabilities. So in order to solve the probability of A and B just generically, when A and B are not independent, are not independent, need to use conditional probabilities. going to grab the blurb, blurb. The conditional probability of outcome A given, right, and so that's going to be very important, given condition B is computed as the following. Okay, so a little bit kind of heftier formula all of a sudden, I think, right? But we we already established that this vertical bar you read as given, right? So the probability of A given B, yeah. so given that B has already happened. Okay. And how you compute it is going to be the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B, right? What's the probability of these two things happening together over the probability that B has already happened, right? The probability of B happening is the base, okay? We can rearrange this in terms of the probability of A and B, because those are the two things that we use this formula for. We can rearrange to solve for the probability of A and B, and say the probability of A and B then is the probability of A given B times the probability of B. Maybe I'll make this kind of stronger. Okay. 
Now we could do the same thing that we did for disjoint outcomes, right? When we had that general addition rule, the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the overlap, right? And then if they're disjoint, then there is no overlap. So then you just subtract zero, right? We can get back to the same formula for the probability of A and B. If A and B are independent, right? then the probability of A given B is just the probability of A, right? It doesn't care about B, right? And so now you're back to that special case of independence. Yeah. And so here, notice if A and B are independent, Can't spell independent today. Independent. The probability of A given B is just the probability of A. So the probability of A and B is just going to be the probability of A times the probability of B. So it is just a special case of the conditional probability. But we had to do a little bit of work to get there. So that's why I didn't want to introduce this first and then go back to the special case. Yeah. But it is just the special case again. Okay. So for that reason, and I know it's going to be hard, especially in the beginning when you're dealing with these probability problems, right? and you're solving for the probability of A and B, I would recommend just always using this formula, right? And then if you find that, okay, A and B are independent, then the probability of A given B, you can just replace it with the probability of A, right? That's only if you're not sure, because it's a lot of work. If you're, if you're sure they're independent, then you can just go ahead and use the simpler formula, but, okay. Um, from have here, okay, yeah, let's, let's do this one still. So, um, from that voting example, so from the voting example, And I'll see what day it was. Maybe it was the probably January 24th. Let's see here. This is the one I want to talk about. On January 24th. We said, or we asked, what percent of these Tampa, Florida voters who identify themselves as conservatives are also in favor of the citizenship option? Now, another way that we could phrase this is given that someone that you selected votes conservative, right? What's the probability that they are in favor of option I? And so here, maybe I'll use light blue. We can now rephrase this as given a randomly selected person votes conservative, what is, what is the probability they are in favor of 
the citizenship option, or uh, let's call it just option I, which I've been calling it today. Yeah. So now we're given some information, right? We're given that they vote conservative. And I always kind of get hung up because usually we were given the initial information first, but that actually goes second in your formula, right? And so let's just write out the general formula, right? The probability of A given B is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. Now you'll have this on a formula sheet, of course, but I just remember it as the first one and the second one, right? That makes the numerator. And then the second one makes the denominator. It's just what it's doing, right? It's, it's not too bad. Okay. But I'm gonna translate this into the variables that we have. So what we're asking is really, in terms of the light blue, right? What's the probability that they're in favor of option I given that they vote conservative? Yeah. As long as you map your A to the A's and the B's to the B's, right? And just make sure that this is exactly what the question is asking for. Right, given that they're conservative, so that goes second. Confusing to me, maybe not to you. The probability, and now I just write the first one and the second one of option I and conservative. Divided by the probability of just being conservative. I think I have these way up. Oh, not even. Okay, so the probability of being in favor of option I and conservative is 0.04758. Gonna write these here and then move them down. 0.04758. And the probability of being conservative, 0.39516. Oops. I'm going to bring these down. And I have roughly 0.12040816333. Now I did use the fractions in my notes, so they might not match up exactly. They match up here though, right? That is the value we found. So we've already found these probabilities. Right, so we didn't really need the conditional probability formula, right? Because we can solve these problems assuming we have the table, right? Without the table, ugh, but it's a nice kind of transition time using the table and, and making sure that, okay, these things match. And now we have this uh, given notation that we can use this conditional probability. Um, I want, first I want, we already developed the general multiplication rule, but we never named it. So we may as well, All right? We rearrange the, the probability of A given B is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. We already did that, okay? Um, but I wanted this one because it is useful to think of A as the outcome of interest, right? The thing that you're interested in, the probability of A, 
And then B is just the condition, right? Given this information. Let's do. Uh, let's do this example. So there's a, a small pox data set that they introduce in the textbook, but I think it's uh, just Boston, smallpox in Boston in 1721. Okay. And so the smallpox data set provides a sample of 6,224 individuals from the year 1721 who were exposed to smallpox in Boston. Okay. Doctors at the time believed that inoculation, which involves exposing a person to the disease in a controlled form, could reduce the likelihood of death. I mean, remember it's 1721, so kind of risky stuff. <laughs> it paid off, obviously, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So here's some data that they collected, right? Whether a person lived or whether they died and whether they were inoculated, yes or no, right? And so I guess I could bring this in here. Oh, you know what? Yeah. I'll just grab this one. Just going straight for the table of proportions. Prop table. So for us, right? We're going to have all this information, but the question that we want to answer, and this is why I chose it, right? Because we're not always going to have the table. Right? Not all questions, not all problems are going to have tables. And so consider the smallpox data set. Suppose we're given only two pieces of information, right? Maybe that's why I didn't have this in here. Delete. We can bring it in later. Look at it. Okay. 96.08% of residents were not inoculated, okay? And 85.88% of the residents who were not inoculated, okay? So what's that? That's a, a conditional probability, right? Because it's of those who were not inoculated. Okay? But so of the 96.08, 8588 right, of the residents, um, ended up surviving, yay. How could we compute the probability that a resident was not inoculated and lived? So this one here, if I'm gonna let, I'll just give you some notation that we can use. I'm gonna let uh, I mean that they were inoculated. How do I spell inoculated? But they didn't. I better, I'm just gonna copy them. I'm assuming uh, spell check was involved at some point. <laughs> right? You would think, right? Uh, and if you're not sure, inoculation is just, it means that they were vaccinated, if you prefer. And S, I'm going to use it to denote whether they survived. Okay. How would I denote that they were not inoculated? Nice. Not inoculated. And S complement. Not survived. They died but I will say not survived first, because sometimes I end up wording things um, in kind of a unorthodox way, but just because the notation works out that way. Okay, so instead of rushing through it with a minute to spare, I'll let you work on that and then we'll finish it on Tuesday. How about that? But if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great weekend. If you didn't get your quiz back yet, come grab it. 
I don't want them. And I'll stop this recording. <laughs>